Hello everyone, wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us here today. I'm Dr. Andrew Sharman, President of IOSH, and I'd like to welcome you to today's IOSH webinar. And a special hello to those of you joining us on Facebook Live as we stream there today too. From the beginning of this pandemic, we've been able to support and collaborate with the WHO in a number of beneficial ways to offer valuable information and guidance, whilst also gathering intelligence that could be used to inform better practice. At IOSH, we are honoured to bring you today's information session, organised in collaboration with the World Health Organisation. In the next hour, we'll share more about World Patient Safety Day coming up on 17th September. It's a campaign to raise global awareness about the importance of looking after the health and safety of all people working in the health and social care sector as a prerequisite to patient safety. This webinar will be in English, and we're pleased also to have simultaneous interpretation into French and Spanish through the interpretations panel. Click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to access these. Et bonjour tout le monde et hola à tous. For us, our primary concern is the health, safety and well-being of the millions of key workers striving to continue to enable healthcare services to be delivered worldwide. IOSH members and the global OSH professional community continues to lead the way in supporting organizations, including those in the health and social care sectors and other essential services to respond appropriately during the crisis. They continue to protect colleagues as well as helping millions of workers adapt to new ways of working and new challenges. As president of IOSH, I'm really proud of how our profession is responding. However, the World Health Organization clearly states that the COVID-19 pandemic has unveiled the huge challenges and risks health workers are facing globally, including healthcare associated infections, burnout, violence, stigma, psychological and emotional distress, illness, and even death. Furthermore, working in stressful environments makes our health workers more prone to errors, which can lead to patient harm. The objective then of World Patient Safety Day is to recognize patient safety as a global health priority, increasing the public's awareness and enhancing global understanding each year on the 17th of September. In our session today, we welcome our colleagues from the World Health Organization, Dr. Maria Neira, Director of the Department of Public Health, Environmental and Social Determinants of Health, Dr. Nilam Dingra, Unit Head of Patient Safety Flagship, and Dr. Ivan Ivanov, Team Leader of Occupational and Workplace Health, who will be telling us more about how World Patient Safety Day came to be, and the critical role that OSH professionals and other professions can have in ensuring health workers' safety, and how we can contribute. We also have a panel representing health worker institutions globally, including Howard Catton, CEO from the International Council of Nurses, Christian Viskov from the International Labour Organization, Baba Ai from the Public Service International, the representations of the trade union perspectives, and Gwen Brackman, Chair of the Scientific Committee on Occupational Health of Health Workers from ICO, that's the International Commission for Occupational Health. Thank you to today's panel for joining us. So to begin with, I'd like to invite Dr. Miriam Nera from the WHO to open this session. Dr. Nera, welcome. Please start sharing your screen and turn on your video. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, thank you all for organizing this very interesting webinar. Of course, uh, a very warm uh, welcome. Uh, bienvenidos y un hola a todos los participantes que hablan español. Et bonjour et bienvenue à tous ces francophones qui vont être capables de nous suivre. Um, it's clear that uh, we have a very important topic this year, the World Patient Safety Day this year, and it's not a surprise for anyone, will be devoted to the health worker safety. It makes a lot of sense because we, we all have still very present the images of those health workers that unfortunately they didn't survive after they uh, dealing with patients and uh, during this terrible pandemic. We have a principle, a very important guiding principle in our healthcare settings. As, as a doctor, uh, this is something that we grow up with, which is the famous principle of primum non nocere, which means 
first, do not harm. And I know that this is something very common, very basic that everybody knows, but I'm afraid it's still at the center of the discussions of today. And more than ever, we need to make sure, sure that we do not harm our patients. But in order to take care of our patients, we need to take care of ourselves as health workers. We need to walk the talk by not harming ourselves and caring from our patients. I always think in the, in the plane when they say, in case of an accident, an oxygen mask will drop. Before taking care of anyone, ensure that you have your mask first and then you take care of others. I think this is quite uh, uh, similar to what we have to do here. We need to take care of our patients, but we need to take care of ourselves as well and making sure that we are not harming the healthcare professionals. You know that occupational health and safety professionals are always in the front line. The, the, the principle is to protect workers from risks, from diseases, from injuries, uh, all of them related to work. And it's true that in the past, all of those occupational health and safety professionals have been doing an amazing job on, on preventing diseases like uh, silicosis. And I still remember very well when I was a very young medical student, the work on preventing silicosis among minors in the north of Spain, in Asturias, where still very young people were dying from uh, exposure uh, from uh, silicosis. And, and the, the, the government was trying to reduce the hazards. And similar in other occupational health exposure in the industry, in agriculture, or in construction. I think we can be very proud of that, although there are still a lot to do. But the health sector is also among the most uh, hazardous for workers. And I'm afraid that maybe we have not done enough research or norms or standards and practical tools to protect the health of safety of our fellow health workers. This is a question for debate today. Maybe we did, but it's an important question mark and an issue that we need to, uh, to face. And of course, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has once again demonstrated and probably on a very brutal way, the major deficiencies in the health worker safety the insufficient coverage and the enforcement of occupational safety and health regulations. Sometimes we have the regulations, but they are not properly enforced. And at the same time, the lack of occupational health services in, in the health facilities. The results we hear every day, infections, suicides, violence and deaths among our own health workers. And this crisis is a challenge in, in the very basic human and labor rights. So it's, this is the moment to rethink about how are we doing and, and facing those labor rights. Do we have enough? Are we enforcing those rights uh, uh, in terms of health and safety or just a, a favorable working condition for all health workers? We need it in hospitals and in, in communities, but we need it as well in cities and villages. Even, even public health workers at all levels are not spared from occupational burnout and threats. Why the health sector, which is supposed to restore and strengthen the health, is not capable to protect the health, safety, and well being of its own workers? We need a broad alliance of governments, professionals, associations, employers, and trade unions in the health sector to build a better, healthier, safer, and greener recovery from COVID-19 in all health services. We can play a role in doing it, but we need to make sure that we protect ourselves as well and we contribute to that effort, which is so much needed at the moment. We are very grateful to the Institution for Occupational Safety and Health for helping us to organize this webinar. We have one purpose, to empower you to use the opportunity of the World Patient Safety Day this year to speak out for the health of workers and their safety. And we need to, to build more commitment for a healthy, safe, and decent working condition for all health workers. We are very happy that uh, our partners from the International Labor Organization, the trade unions, occupational health and safety specialists, 
practitioners and nurses associations are also with us to raise the, their voices about health worker safety. And this is really a, a great satisfaction. By the way, happy Clean Air Day. Today is the first ever international Clean Air and Blue Sky Day. Again, another risk factor that is putting at risk and not only our citizens, but our health workers. And now with, uh, again, thanking you for the opportunity, I will pass over to my WHO colleagues, Nilan and Ivan, who will provide you with the tips and arguments for all of the above. Thank you so much and uh, over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Maria. Well, indeed, let's just do that right away. Dr. Nilam Dingra and Dr. Ivan Ivanov, please share your screens and open your video links. Uh, I am Ivan Ivanov and I'm the team leader of the WHO Global Occupational and Workplace Health Program in Geneva. And I'm also working with a lot of colleagues around the house and with the regional offices. Uh, uh, toward uh, protecting health and safety of all workers, but uh, with the very big uh, attention to, to health workers. Uh, next, please. With this presentation, I just want to open the discussion about do we care enough for those who care? Uh, hopefully also not for us that we hope we will not become patients, but just to give you some facts. 54% half of health workers in low and middle income countries have latent tuberculosis and sometimes even multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. When we had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the uh, infection rate among health workers was so high, it was 21 to 32 times higher than the general population. The ongoing outbreak COVID is still going on. We do not have definite data about how many health workers are affected or will be affected and what is the proportion, but it's likely around 14, 15% of all cases of COVID-19 are among health workers. Also between 44 and 83% of nurses in clinical settings in Africa have chronic low back pain. I remember visiting the orthopedic department of the teaching hospital in uh, Namibia, uh, in Botswana, and half of the nurses were usually on sick leave. 90% of them had low back pain. Imagine how you can serve patients in an orthopedic department with low back pain. Between 17 and 32% of health workers in developed countries suffer from occupational burnout. 63% of health workers report experiencing any form of violence. Also, it is true that medical professions, doctors are also among the highest risk occupations and the highest risk of suicides in parts of the world. We have witnessed emergency nurses in emergency departments in the COVID-19 outbreak committing suicide. And uh, during this pandemic, 23% of frontline health workers suffer depression and anxiety, and about 38% suffer also insomnia, which is leading to other chronic diseases. Next one, please. People usually ask, well, is there political commitment for taking action on this? Well, last year there was a high level meeting at the 74th session of the uh, United Nations General Assembly. There was a high level meeting on universal health coverage. And in the resolution, the heads of state and government and representatives of states and government committed to scale up efforts to promote healthy and safer workplaces and improve access to occupational health services for all workers, including also for health workers, and specifically to take necessary steps at the country level to protect health workers from all forms of violence, from also from uh, to improve their decent and safe and uh, working conditions and to ensure they are healthy, safe, and fit also to, to serve. Next one, please. 
So for these reasons, WHO and the International Labour Organization, we have worked with countries and we advocate for the development of national programs for occupational health and safety for health workers in the health sector. The purpose of these programs, and we'll be launching uh, on the, for the World Patient Safety Day, a special policy brief, and then there will be a lot of technical materials on how to do these programs but the purpose, the main purpose is to make sure that occupational safety and health laws and regulations, they are applied also in the health sector, which is not always the case. In some countries, health services are excluded from the scope of occupational safety and health regulations. In other countries, hospitals are so less likely to be visited by labor or occupational safety and health inspectors. And if they are visited, that may cover only the, the uh, <clears throat> risks of uh, explosion or the, the elevators or different other safety risks. But also by improving working conditions in, in the healthcare facilities, we improve patient safety, productivity of health workers, quality of care. There's a lot of research that has documented these uh, links. And we see also how improving and protecting the health of workers is making health services more resilient when there are outbreaks and other public health emergencies. And also health workers stay in the health sector. We're losing a lot of health workers leaving the health sector, going to work in the markets on the streets because of violence, because of low back pain. These are the leading causes after, of course, uh, low pay in Africa for health sectors leaving the uh, for health workers leaving the health sector. Next one, please. WHO and ILO developed a global framework for national occupational health programs for health workers. And this was developed almost 10 years ago, but many countries have already implemented this framework. And these are the 13 elements of the global framework, which means that a country should have a written policy on safety and health and working conditions at the national level, but also all healthcare facilities should have such policy to ensure that their workers are protected. In every country, there should be a person, better even a unit uh, at the national level, identified to uh, be in charge of occupational health and safety of health workers. And in every facility, there should be at least a focal point who is making sure that health workers are protected. Of course, they have to be occupational health services for the bigger healthcare facility budget, personal protective equipment. There have to be some form of a dialogue between the managers, between the interested parties and the workers, both at the national level and at the facility level. We call these labor management health and safety committees to ensure that workers are engaged and they also understand and they also their concerns are also reflected in the facility policy and action. There has to be an ongoing education and training for responsible persons in healthcare facilities and for the members of the health and safety committees. Regular risk assessment of workplaces and processes and ensure that the measures of control are functioning and are effective. Health workers should be immunized against hepatitis B and other vaccine preventable diseases, for example, seasonal, seasonal influenza. There has to be a blame-free environment for reporting of exposures and incidents, such as exposures to blood and body fluids or incidents of violence. Of course, it is important to provide uh, with priority diagnosis, treatment and care and support for occupational infections among health workers. It is necessary to integrate all the information regarding health and safety of health workers into the national informa health information systems and develop indicators. All health workers should have also access and should be covered by the employment injury schemes and for compensation of work-related disability and uh, occupational diseases and injuries. Of course, we uh, argue for more research and evaluation of the measures in healthcare facilities and the link to improving the environment, to environmental hygiene, particularly the management of healthcare waste, the provision of water and sanitation, and also personal hygiene services, cleaning, uh, and uh, use of chemicals. Next one, please. 
the mechanisms for implementation of these uh, programs uh, we had uh, uh, a month ago, we had an inter-country meeting also to review how the countries have implemented such programs and what uh, difficulties they faced. Uh, it's usually at the national level, it is important to have a unit in the Ministry of Health, which is in charge with uh, uh, occupational health and safety of health workers and to have technical resources. Uh, some countries have also such responsible people at the sub-national level in the district health teams and at the facility level, at least a focal point responsible for occupational safety and health, working together with infection control, with uh, uh, patient safety programs. At the national level, usually countries have uh, a committee on health, safety, uh, health and safety in the health sector, including representatives of workers, employers, and government agencies, for example, the ministries of labor, and at the facility level, labor management, health and safety committees. The enforcement can be done in many ways, but uh, some countries have chosen to integrate occupational health and safety in part as part of the inspection of health facilities and their compliance with the uh, regulations for being a health facility in the country, uh, but also through the provision of occupational health services, including occupational safety and health in the accreditation of healthcare facilities, uh, developing special financial mechanisms. For, for example, in France, there are special budget lines for occupational safety and health in health facilities and extending the existing uh, mechanisms for uh, schemes for employment injury benefits. This is the insurance for occupational diseases and injuries to all workers, all health workers in the, in the health sector. The next one, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, with uh, with uh, our our sister organization, the International Labour Organization, we have a very long tradition of issuing jointly materials, uh, guidelines, uh, training materials, capacity building tools for improving working conditions in the health sector. Uh, there is uh, the tool for work improvement in health services available in several languages. is uh, is extremely popular and has stimulated many countries actually to go and develop such national programs for occupational health of, of health workers. We also have a, a joint manual for protecting health workers and responders in public health emergencies, which is also available currently in four, in four languages. And uh, you can use these materials also in, in your work. Um, next one, please. Last week, uh, uh, we launched a, a uh, online, free online course on occupational health and safety for health workers, which is available through the WHO big platform the called Open WHO on Courses. And it's a, it's a short course for, uh, for health workers to take and to learn how they can protect their health and safety in the context of COVID-19. I just checked the, the website and there were more than 12,000 already enrollments in this course. I'm extremely surprised to see that. So, so big, a um, big number of people expressed interest in this course of, within one week only and it, it will be available also in, in other languages. Next one, please. Next one is our Director General, Dr. Tedros, who made a special statement at the ILO Summit on COVID-19 at the World of Work to all heads of state. WHO calls on governments, employers, and workers, organizations in the health sector to develop strong and sustainable national programs for occupational safety of health workers. More than 50 countries have already implemented such programs and demonstrated the benefits in public health emergencies. Together, we have a duty to protect those who protect us. I thank you and I wish you a productive discussion. So um, my name is Neelam Dhingra. I'm the unit head for patient safety flagship, a decade of patient safety from 2020 to 2013. Um, patient safety uh, has uh, been uh, one of the uh, forefronts, or the, I would say at the heart of universal health coverage. Um, over the last couple of years, 
there has been a phenomenal global patient safety movement, which was started by the UK and the German governments uh, launching a series of global ministerial summits on patient safety. And, and these summit series starting from 2016 in London, uh, hosted by the, by the UK government and in 2017 hosted by the German government. Then it uh, was held in 2018 in Japan and in 2019 in Saudi Arabia. And this year it was supposed to be held in Switzerland and we hope that um, we are able to organize either a virtual summit or sometime next year. But these uh, five series of summits which, were, uh, which took place since 2016 created a huge global momentum on patient safety. And 2019 actually was a watershed moment uh, for patient safety globally, because that was the year uh, in addition to the fourth ministerial summit, uh, which took place in Jeddah in the month of March, uh, there were several, several important events and, and, and landmarks which we passed through to arrive at a landmark resolution, which was uh, adopted last year at the World Health Assembly, the Global Action on Patient Safety. This resolution um, identified patient safety as a global health priority, uh, placing it at the center of countries' efforts for universal health coverage. Um, following that, uh, building onto the actions for, for the resolution and implementing the resolution, one of the key uh, activities uh, as part of the resolution was establishment of a World Patient Safety Day. So um, uh, in, the, in the process of implementing the resolution, the very first action which WHO took with all partners and stakeholders around the world was to um, to observe the very first, first ever World Patient Safety Day, which was held on, to, on uh, 17 September, 2019. And that was a phenomenal success. We created a legacy and an identity for the World Patient Safety Day. And you can see on the screen, the logo, which was actually created last year. And, and it has been updated every year, of course. Uh, and this is the logo which provides the helping hand of a health worker to a patient and, and, and showing the interaction between health worker and patients for patient safety. Uh, so um, the, the, year, uh, the World Patient Safety Day observed last year was a phenomenal success. Uh, it had several elements of the campaign as well as the technical components. But one of the signature marks was lighting up of iconic monuments in colored orange. So I'll, I'll share that in detail with you later on uh, in this presentation. So coming back to a couple of slides, which I'm going to show. So I'm going to sh uh, speak about primarily how we are taking forward the World Patient Safety Day this year. And in the month of February, we had a global consultation uh, where we brought together all stakeholders and country representatives uh, and experts um, from around the world. And we collectively agreed that um, looking at the, um, the challenges and unveiling of challenges which was coming through the, the COVID pandemic, uh, it became very apparent that we had to address the issue of health worker safety because health worker safety and patient safety are really interconnected and health worker safety is a prerequisite for patient safety. And, and that's the reason it was identified as a theme for um, this year's World Patient Safety Day, health worker safety, a priority for patient safety. Next, please. Just, just walking through a couple of slides, the COVID-19 pandemic, is actually the biggest threat with the world and humanity is uh, facing. And healthcare is actually living its greatest crisis in patient safety ever, and also health worker safety ever, because these are all preventable harm. So any issue of preventable harm, as, as Maria mentioned, first do no harm is the principle uh, of providing healthcare. So we, we are looking after, um, the, we are developing systems which prevent harm to patients as well as they should prevent harm for healthcare workers as well. Next, please. And it also demonstrated that, uh, next slide, please. The COVID pandemic has also exerted unprecedented pressure on health systems worldwide. And it has unveiled challenges and risks which health workers face daily. And these risks are to infections, to psychological and emotional disturbances, violence, illness, and even death, amongst many others. Next, please. Working in stressful and non-conducive environments makes health workers more prone to making errors. 
And this is, this is uh, something which is absolutely easily understandable that when the environment in which health workers are working is not really conducive and, and, and empowering, and also uh, there's a safety culture in which they are working, they are under stress and pressurized environments would lead to health workers making them more prone to making errors, which can lead to harm uh, to patients, but also to health workers. Next, please. And aligning with the International Year of Nurse and Midwife, we also recognize that nurses and midwives are actually at a particular high risk of work-related stress, burnout, and mental health problems. So through the World Patient Safety Day, we are trying to look into how do we address these problems. Now, as speaking about patient safety and the interrelation between patient safety and health worker safety, as we, uh, we recognize the principle um, of healthcare system is first do no harm, and patient safety has been identified as one of the most important components of healthcare delivery, which is critical to achieving UHC. Next, please. Estimates suggest that uh, in the low and middle income countries only, every minute, five patients die because of unsafe care. And these are, these are actually underestimates. And these are all preventable harm. They are deaths and, and harm as well. And, and there are actually more than 134 million adverse events which are reported in hospital care in low and middle income countries. So it's a huge burden of harm in the healthcare system, which happens every minute, every day, every, every year, year after year, it's been happening. So the resolution of last year actually provides a, a very strong foundation for us to work for next 10 years to improve systems and, and patient safety and also health worker safety. Uh, another figure I want to share with you that in high income countries from the estimates which are available, one in 10 patients is harmed while receiving hospital care. And more than 50% actually, and some studies show even up to 80% of these errors and, and harm actually is avoidable. Next, please. And we recognize that health workers are frequently exposed to range of hazards in their day-to-day -day work, such as biological hazards, chemical, physical, mental health risks, and also exposure to violence, just to, to name a few. And, and the system has to look after to, ad to address these issues, one in three health workers. Next, please. Could have the next slide, please. Yeah. One in three health workers in high income countries suffer from work related burnout at, at the workplace. And Ivan and, and Maria as well um, emphasize these uh, the huge burden of uh, burnout uh, to health workers, even in high income countries. Next, please. Next, please. Globally, six out of 10 health workers report experiencing a form of violence at the workplace. I mean, these are issues which have been there for, for quite some time, but the, the COVID pandemic and the challenges which health workers have faced around the world this year has really brought to attention and focus the major issues health workers are facing in day-to-day -day care, provision of care day after day. Next, please. And if you look at the figures of COVID infections, uh, so far around 10% of all cases of COVID-19 globally are among health workers. And these figures are being looked at very carefully to look into what is the actual burden of harm. And there have been, uh, there have been deaths in healthcare workers, uh, you know, huge burden of, of COVID infection in healthcare workers, and most of, most of it actually happens at the workplace itself. Next, please. Now, I'll just show you a couple of uh, figures and slides to show the linkages between the, um, the health worker safety and patient safety. Could I have the next slide, please? So stress and burnout, as I mentioned earlier, in health workers has a significant impact on safety of patients because, because this burnout will actually make them more prone to errors. And, and this, these errors not only lead to, you know, have the risk of causing harm to patients, but also to health workers. And this high level of burnout is mainly due to factors such as high workload, long hours, and even because of the stress of working pressurized environment, also strained interpersonal relationship and also lack of team, teamwork to work together. Next, please. There is evidence 
that physicians suffering from depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms are associated with increased risk of medication, medical errors. Next, please. So these were just a couple of figures I wanted to show you. And I'm now coming to the action we want to take to address these major challenges and risks which patients and health workers are facing around the world. So on the 17th of September this year, WHO will launch a campaign of health worker safety, a priority for patient safety. Next, please. And the slogan, which actually shows the interlinkages between the two is safe health workers, safe patients. The global call for action is to speak up for health worker safety. Next, please. The calls for action, which we have identified particularly with the stakeholders, and then these are a couple of stakeholders which you see on your screen, uh, patients and families and caregivers, professional association, international organizations, patient and civil society organizations, healthcare leaders, health workers, policy makers, and also academic and research institutions. We have given a, a, a urging action by the key stakeholders who, whose, whose action can make a significant difference in improving the safety of health workers and patients. Next, please. Could I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned earlier, the signature mark of the day has been in 2019 to light up monuments in color orange. And we want to make it a legacy of the day and urging partners, countries, healthcare facilities around the world to demonstrate global solidarity by lighting up monuments and iconic landmarks in color orange on the 17th September. And this is the Jeddah in Geneva, which was lit up last year uh, in color orange. And even this year, we have a confirmation that if weather permits, we would have the Jeddah in the color orange. Some other monuments, actually, last year we had um, the pyramids in Giza also lit up um, in orange color. There actually is a compilation of these uh, videos, uh, which is available on the um, World Patient Safety Day 2020 website of WHO. Next, please. A couple of campaign materials which are available on WHO website, posters, social media cards, and you can see the, the concept of a, she, of a shield to protect healthcare workers and, and patients. That's the campaign uh, signature um, design which has been created for this year and several materials um, which are, um, could be downloaded uh, for different types of purposes, um, whether it's virtual event or it's an it's a in-person event, roller banners, posters, and several of these materials can be used uh, for, for um, meetings, as well as several products for social media, the social media cards, frames and banners. And I would request all those who are on the, on the, on the webinar today to, to drum beat and amplify the messages of this campaign. Next, please. So um, the logo which was created as part of the legacy for the day is available in uh, at least in six official languages of WHO, and even others have been uh, made available, and also in different formats, vertical, horizontal, depending on how countries would like to use it, and uh, also in different colors. So these are now available for use for, for um, all partners and stakeholders, and these are also available on the website. You, you access the website and ask, look for campaign logo, and these can be uh, easily down, down, downloadable. So um, coming to a list of technical products, in addition to the campaign, which is for global advocacy, we are also emphasizing the need to actually take action on the ground. And some of the tools and technical products which WHO has developed through, it's working with several departments within WHO, in which includes patient safety, occupation, health and safety, health workforce, mental health, um, um, infection prevention control, communication department, quality of care, several departments together have worked on technical products which are planned to be launched on the 17th September. And one of the um, uh, important ones uh, is the Health Worker Safety Charter, which outlines 
um, the key actions which we are urging member states and all stakeholders and partners to take and all health facilities and healthcare leaders and managers to take uh, to improve uh, safety of health workers and patients. And these broadly relate to developing linkages between occupational health, patient safety, infection control, and different programs at the facility level and at, at all levels, um, national and subnational and facility level, and also addressing the issues of uh, violence as well as mental health, uh, infections, as well as um, looking into the entire environment, uh, safe working environment, in reducing st uh, stress and burnout in health facilities. In addition, linked with the theme of this year, WHO also is uh, going to propose five World Patient Safety Day 2020 goals. And these goals are specifically designed for action at healthcare facilities level so that it can the, the campaign could actually translate into action for improvement. And these relate to avoiding sharp injuries, reducing stress and, and burnout at workplace, um, improving personal protection practices, uh, and also reporting and measuring uh, se serious safety-related incidents in health facilities and uh, developing a system and ensuring a zero tolerance to violence um, at, at workplace. So these are the four goals and there are some uh, documents being developed to support the um, outlining the goals as well as what support WHO could provide uh, to health facilities in particular to implement these goals. Policy brief on health worker safety and patient safety implications on health system is another tool we are developing for, uh, for advocacy to prioritize the health worker safety and patient safety um, in the health system and what are its implications um, to build a case for health worker safety in particular. And Ivan mentioned that policy brief on establishing national occupation health programs. Uh, in addition, WHO patient safety flagship is also uh, going to launch reporting and learning guidance for reporting of a patient safety um, incidents and the infection prevention control core, core competencies as well as fact sheet on health worker infection and risk factors are also planned to be launched on the 17th of September. Um, in the end, I would just like to mention that um, to commemorate the day, WHO along with all partners, patient organizations, um, professional organizations, as well as countries and regions and all experts around the world, we are putting together a virtual event on the 17th September from two o'clock um, uh, European time uh, to, to five o'clock. So three hours global virtual event, one world global solidarity for health worker safety and patient safety. And it's planned to be opened by Deputy Director General of WHO and Mr. Jeremy Hunt. And it has primarily three um, sections after, uh, after the opening where Salim Donaldson, uh, WHO patient safety envoy who would give a deliver a keynote address and um, Ms. Elizabeth Iro, who's the Chief Nursing Officer of WHO to speak on International Year of Nurse and Midwife. Then we'll go into different departments and different programs within WHO and their work and launching a product. And then stories from the regions and countries and then partners initiatives. So we're putting, to, putting together a program which can um, emphasize the need for health worker safety, its linkages with patient safety, its impact on patient safety, as well as what is being done globally to address this issue and sharing some of the important initiatives with, with all those who joined the, um, the virtual event and also um, uh, urging and asking for action and implementation uh, of the charter, signing up to the charter and as well as endorsing it. So with that, and this is the link below, which I, I will be happy to share with you to link up to the webinar. And uh, to, to finish uh, this brief presentation, I would like to ask all of you uh, for your support and global solidarity for World Patient Safety Day and for health worker safety as a priority for patient safety. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Super. Thank and you, thank Dr. Ivan. Dingra, Dr. Ivan Ivanov. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a little behind time, so I'm going to move very briskly to inviting uh, four panelists to, to join us now, one at a time, uh, and share some very brief remarks, just a, a, about a minute or so each. First, Howard Catton, CEO from the International Council of Nurses. 
Howard, go ahead and share your screen and uh, tell us what's on your mind, please. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much. Delighted to join uh, IOSH and WHO and our full support for this year's focus on Patient Safety Day on Global Solidarity of Healthcare Workers and Patient Safety. Uh, I'm a nurse. I'm CEO of the International Council of Nurses, 130 national nursing associations around, around the world, 26 million uh, nurses. We've been collating information on infections, COVID infections amongst nurses uh, and deaths tragically as well since the beginning of this pandemic. We reckon that 10% of healthcare workers at least have become infected. The number of deaths runs into hundreds. You want more details, go to our website and we've got an update next week on all of that. Um, but I just want to give you a human side to this as well. The first email that I opened this morning uh, was from our association in the Bahamas to sadly inform me of the death of a nurse called Bernadetta. Bernadetta worked in a long-term care facility. She contracted COVID. She died last week. Uh, Bernadetta has two children, a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and Bernadetta was a single mum as well. We owe it not only to our healthcare workers, but we owe it to their children and to their families to do all we can to protect their lives. Their lives are as important as the patients that they care for. But we also know that the, work, the, work, the safety of the workforce and nurses and all health workers is inseparably connected to that of patient safety. We call it two sides of the same coin. Uh, this is a year, a year of the nurse and the midwife to celebrate nurses and midwives. Uh, sadly, we are mourning and grieving many of them. But if through this focus on patient safety and health workforce safety, the legacy can truly be to change the mindset so that fewer of our colleagues die or suffer injury or harm at work in the future, then perhaps we will have made an important difference and step forward. Thank you very much. Howard Catton, CEO from the International Council of Nurses, thank you very much for that humanistic perspective. Uh, our thoughts are with you and also Benedetta's family and the families of those who do this amazing work which you represent. Baba I represents the trade union perspective uh, at Public Service International. Baba, great to have you here. What are your thoughts, please? Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, um, congratulations to IOSH and uh, WHO for this um, webinar. I would say for us, the place to start is the question of safe and effective staffing for health. If you were to take um, an aspect of healthcare delivery, the fact, the, the public health emergencies, which is more like in our faces, like the COVID now, as a football match uh, between two sides, with health workers being the players uh, for the side of humankind, patients and everybody, and uh, instead of uh, 11 players, you have uh, five or six players. Uh, no matter how well kitted they are, no matter how much they play with all their spirit, they are likely to be uh, swamped, over swamped, uh, especially when the other side, the side of the microbes, uh, has much more than 11 players, and uh, we keep discovering more. So the, the fact of the matter is that we need to have enough health workers for us. For, to ensure patient safety and uh, universal health care. And it is rather worrisome uh, that um, we must say that uh, governments need to walk their talk. Uh, the WHO Global Strategy on uh, Human uh, Resource for Health by 2030 showed that the need for at least 18 million more health workers by 2030 for universal health coverage to be achieved. Uh, the United Nations High Level Commission on Health Employment and Economic Growth, which the uh, PSI represented, uh, organized labor and public services on, reiterated this in 2016. And on the basis of that, in 2017, the World Health Assembly passed the resolution on working for health to, you know, a five-year program to try and uh, meet this shortfall. I must commend our colleagues in WHO and ILO for efforts they have put into this just one year uh, to the termination of the five-year action plan. If governments had um, taken up 10% of the efforts put in, uh, we would not have the shortfall of uh, health workers that we faced uh, when the pandemic uh, commenced and, and is going on. So I think that that is a place to start. And then trade union rights, decent work for health workers needs to be emphasized. We have uh, witnessed, like uh, uh, in Liberia, for example, where 
workers had to complain because they were asked to wash latex gloves that should be worn single use. And when this was raised, the, 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 the workers initially we are, we are, so to speak, disciplined until the trade unions stepped in strongly and then the Federal Ministry of Health did the needful. So there's a need for the trade union and labor rights of workers to be respected. And there's a need for government to put priority. A lot of money you, you, you have, um, what is used to kit, kit a police who goes to quell riots, a single police, I mean, could kit 55 nurses, you know, complete with uh, respirators. And Thank you, you Baba. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you here. Oh, we are oh, out of time. Uh, I, I'm very grateful for you joining us. That's uh, Baba I representing the trade union perspective at Public Service International. Let's go right. to uh, our remaining panelist, Gwen Brachman, then. Gwen is chair of the Scientific Committee on Occupational Health of Health Workers from the International Commission for Occupational Health, ICO. Gwen, great to see you. What are your final remarks, please? Thank you very much. So actually, to continue in Baba's vein, um, Health workers are one of the largest workforces in the world. There are 60 million of us at the moment. We have the highest uh, or one of the highest uh, rates of injury and illness. Um, we already have a shortfall, as Bob has indicated, of over 7 million. And we're expected to have a shortfall of health workers of at least 13 million by 2035. I think we need to remember that uh, there are a lot of hazards in the workplace, more than just infections, particularly psychosocial, burnout, violence, low back pain. And we need to commit and have others commit to the hierarchy of controls. It's not all about personal protective equipment, although that's what seems to be on everybody's mind. But there are so many other ways to protect our health workers. Um, health worker safety translates directly into patient safety. And basically, if we don't start taking care of our health workers now, there won't be any health workers left to take care of us when we need them. Thank you. This is, this is Ivan. Um, while we are waiting eventually for, uh, for my colleague from the ILO to join, I want, I want to emphasize why we organized this, this meeting. It is to stimulate the participants to have campaigns and events before the 17th, during the 17th of September, after the 17th of September in their countries to speak up for health worker safety. And there is a special in the campaign portal of WHO, there is a special also link where people can share what they did and how they did it. And all these contributions will be part of a WHO report on the World Patient Safety Day speaking up for health worker safety. And certainly we will organize another also event on the 18th of uh, September to present all the materials that were launched, to, to give this community, to empower this community for sustainably arguing for health worker safety and relations to patient safety. Thank you, Ivan. I appreciate the extra comment there. And if, uh, if you've noticed already in the chat box at the side of, uh, of your screen, you can click on chat, open that up. You'll find Dr. Ivanov's already posted some links there. We'll share those with you after this webinar too at the irsh.com forward slash coronavirus pages. So let me draw things towards a close then now and thank each of the panelists for the statements and thank Dr. Ivanov and uh, Dr. Dingra from the WHO for, for their great presentations. Uh, let me just read out a, a statement now on behalf of IOSH, please. People working in healthcare are responsible for patient safety, but they can't guarantee patient safety if they aren't safe and healthy themselves. Those who work in healthcare face risk on a daily basis. This has only been enhanced by the COVID-19 pandemic, during which time they've continued to provide a vital service for us, despite these risks, which include, but are not limited to, transmission of the virus, fatigue caused by the long hours worked, and psychological and emotional distress. But no person should have their safety or health negatively impacted by the work they do, regardless of what they do or where they do it. Everyone has the right to expect they will return home after they've finished their shift without being put at risk of a work-related injury or illness. As with other sectors, good safety and health management is crucial in this regard. 
Many of our IOSH members work in healthcare and play a key role in implementing good safety and health management systems. Some of these members are part of our health and social care group, which brings together professionals in this sector to discuss challenges and seek solutions. Ahead of World Patient Safety Day, I'd like to encourage all OSH professionals, not just those working in healthcare, to get behind this initiative. Please help us to raise awareness by sharing information across your social media channels. You can get lots of materials, including posters for social posts, on the campaign webpage. As the campaign slogan says, safe healthcare workers mean safe patients. So let's get behind this campaign, promote the importance of protecting healthcare workers, and make a difference to not just their lives, but those of the patients they look after too. Now, in closing, many thanks to you all for participating today. We'll be welcoming our panel back again on Friday the 18th of September to part two of this webinar, where we'll be highlighting the outcomes of World Patient Safety Day and also sharing the perspectives of occupational health and occupational safety and health practitioners, professional associations and trade unions and what they're doing towards improving the working conditions and protecting the health, safety and well-being of health workers at work. The link to this next webinar is now available in the chat box, so please register to attend and feel free to share it with your colleagues too. I'm grateful to all of you for joining us today and taking part in this webinar. A big thank you to the World Health Organization for your address and for bringing this panel together. Many thanks also to the interpreters who have helped us make this webinar more accessible. You'll find a pop-up looking for feedback on your screen, just the answers to two questions right now. We'd appreciate receiving your thoughts on this session. And we look forward to welcoming you all back in a couple of weeks' time on the 18th of September, following World Patient Safety Day. You'll also find an article in the IOSH magazine about World Patient Safety Day too, also with contributions from WHO, IOSH's Health and Social Care Group, ICO, and others. For further updates, please follow our social media channels. Take care of yourselves, stay safe and healthy. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Goodbye for now.